In this lesson, we're going to take a look at products and quotients of functions. And in the first example, we're given that f of x is x minus 2, and g of x is this x squared minus x minus 2 function. And we're asked to find the equation for p of x, which is defined to be f of x times g of x. And then we're going to sketch and state the domain and range of the function. So this is what p of x is. So we'll substitute in place of f of x the x minus 2, and in place of g of x the x squared minus x minus 2. Now, this will factor. and by factoring, we'll actually find a characteristic of the graph. So in order to factor that, you look for two numbers to add to negative 1 because the coefficient of the linear term is negative 1. And they have a product of negative 2 because the constant in the end is negative 2. And those numbers are negative 2 and 1. So this will factor into x minus 2 and x plus 1. And you can check that by expanding these two out and you should get x squared minus x minus 2. Now these two factors are the same, so instead of writing x minus 2 times another x minus 2, we'll write as x minus 2 squared times x plus 1. And knowing that there's a, uh, a double factor here, then there, we, uh, we know that there is a double root there, and so that means something about the characteristic of, uh, a certain characteristic of the graph. Another characteristic that's good to know when sketching functions is what the y-intercept is. And we find that by putting 0 in place of x. So we put 0 in place of x here. So 0 minus 2 squared times 0 plus 1. So negative 2 squared is 4 times this would be 1 would be 4. So that equals 4, which means that the y-intercept is right there at 4. So the graph's going to go through the y-axis at 4. Now if we set each of these functions x minus 2 and x plus 1 to 0, just like this, so if we set uh, x minus 2 to 0 and solve for x, we'll get 2. And if we set x plus 1 equal to 0 and solve for x, we'll get x equals negative 1. So that's why negative 1 and 2 are the uh, roots of this function, or zeros. And so we know that the graph goes through the x-axis at negative 1 and positive 2. Now it's also a positive cubic function. If we expanded this out, we would get x squared times x for the uh, largest power of x. So it would be x cubed. has a positive coefficient. It's 1x cubed, positive 1x cubed. So it's a positive cubic function. And positive cubic functions start in the third quadrant and go through and, and uh, end past, past and th passing through the first quadrant. They have that general cubic shape, kind of looks something like this. So the function would have to look like this. It would have to start in the third quadrant, come up here and pass through the x-axis at negative 1. The y-intercept is at 4, so it cuts through at 4. Comes down here, and the double root of x minus 2 squared means it just touches the x-axis at 2, but does not pass through it, and then starts going up again. So that's what the function would look like. And of course, you could add other ordered pairs to the function to in increase its accuracy, but that's pretty much what it looks like. Now, because of the fact that it goes forever to the left and forever to the right, there's no number you cannot put in place of x. x could be anything whatsoever here. Anything you put in place of x, you will get a, a y value 4. So we say then the domain is the entire set of real numbers. The same is true for the range. Because it goes down forever and up forever, the range is the entire set of real numbers. Flipping over to the second example, we're given that f of x is, again, x minus 2, and g of x is the same function as in example 1. And we're asked to find the equation for q of x, which is defined to be f of x divided by g of x. And then we'll sketch and state the domain and range. So f of x is the x minus 2, so we'll make that substitution. And the g of x is the x squared minus x minus 2. And we'll factor just like we did in the, in the first example. x squared minus x minus 2 factors into x minus 2 times x plus 1. Now this will simplify if we divide out those x minus 2's. Now there's still a 1 in the numerator because x minus 2 divided by x minus 2 is still 1. There's 1 in the numerator and 1 in the denominator times this x plus 1 which is still just x plus 1. So q of x simplifies to 1 over x plus 1. So that's the simplified version of q of x. 
Now we would have a vertical asymptote, that's my abbreviation for vertical asymptote, at negative 1. And so that line goes right through here. What that line means is that the function is undefined at negative 1. We cannot substitute negative 1 in place of x, because if we do, in the denominator, negative 1 plus 1 would be 0, and we'd have 1 divided by 0, and you're, you cannot divide by 0. So the function is actually undefined there. Now to know how the function behaves, because um, what happens near an asymptote is the function values get very large, large negatives or large positives. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute a number, and remember that's where x is negative 1, a little bit below negative 1, a little bit above negative 1, and evaluate that and see what the function value becomes. So if we put negative 1.01, that's just very slightly to the left of that line, in place of x here. Uh, we would have 1 divided by, and now negative 0 0.01 plus 1 is negative 0 0.01. If you divide 1 by negative 0 0.01, you get negative 100. And so what that means is that as you approach the uh, vertical asymptote from the left, the function value is going way down here, has a very large, and you're not supposed to actually cross, make it look like you cross the uh, vertical asymptote, it almost looks like it is there. The fun y value or function value is becoming a very large negative value. And we write that mathematically like this. As x approaches negative 1 from the left, y, the y is approaching negative infinity. Now, <clears throat> let's test the number to the immediate right of that line uh, at, for example, negative 0.99. If we put that in place of x, the denominator becomes positive 0 0.01, and 1 divided by positive 0 0.01 is positive 100. And so that means as x approaches negative 1 from the right side, the y's values or function values are approaching positive infinity. And so that means as you come from the right side here, that what's happening is the y value is becoming extremely large and going up like that. Now there's a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0 for this uh, rational function, and that's because as x becomes large, we have 1 divided by a very large number, and that's getting really, really close to 0. So the horizontal asymptote is how the function behaves for big values of x, big positives or big negatives. And so if you put a large value in place of x here, 1 divided by a large number gets really close to 0. So y equals 0 is the um, x-axis. And so we're, what we're going to do is investigate what happens to the far left and what happens to the far right. And we'll do that by putting a large number in place of x. So we're going to do the far left first. I'm going to put negative 100 in place of x. So negative 100 plus 1 would be negative 99. And that's getting really close to 0, but it's negative because it's 1 positive 1 divided by a negative large number. And so that's tending towards 0. So as x tends towards negative infinity, a large negative number, y is tending towards 0, but it's negative. And so what that means on the graph is that if you go to the far left, now you're approaching 0 from below. So that means to the far left, what's happening is we're staying below that horizontal asymptote, below the x-axis. Looks something like that. We'll investigate to the far right as well by putting positive 100 in place of x. If you want to put 1,000 or a million, that's OK. If we put 100 there, we get 1 over 100 plus 1 or 101, which is getting close to 0, but it is positive now. So as x tends towards infinity, y approaches 0, but from above. And so what it looks like in the graph is we're going to the far right here, but we're staying above that horizontal asymptote, above the x-axis. Now these x minus 2 factors divided out. X is e if x was 2, then each of those factors would have a value of 0. And because the fact that 2 is a number that makes each of those 0, you actually cannot have a value of 2 in this function. Uh, if we didn't divide those out, then if you went to find g of 2, you would get a 0 in the top and a 0 in the bottom. It would be uh, undefined or indeterminate. And so, uh, and I'll get to that in just a second here, uh, the y-intercept would be at 1. I did forget that. If we put 0 in place of x, we get uh, 1 over 0 plus 1, which is 1 over 1, which is 1. So it goes through the y-axis at 1 here. So back to my uh, undefined thing here. If we put 2 in place of x, uh, 2 plus 1 to the denominator is 3. So we get 1 over a third. So what that means is that at the point 2 comma 1 third, there's a hole in the function. So the, the fun this function actually doesn't have a hole in it. 
Okay, but the one here that we simplify does because x can't actually equal 2 in this if we didn't divide those x minus 2's because it would make it undefined. These two functions are the same except for where x is 2. Okay, this one actually doesn't have a hole in it, but this one does because of the fact those x minus 2's were divided out. So if we, if we graph the function now, so here we were going to the far left and staying below the horizontal asymptote, comes down here like this, uh, goes up to the uh, really, really high on the right side of the asymptote, comes down, crosses through at 1, uh, passes by this hole, and then continues to the far right. Now the domain of this function would be the entire set of real numbers except x cannot equal negative 1 at the vertical asymptote or 2 at this where this hole is. The range would be the entire set of real numbers with the exceptions of uh, at the uh, the horizontal asymptote where y is 0, uh, y can't equal 0, uh, and of course y couldn't equal a third because this is the only point on the graph where y is a third and it's a hole in the function so y can't equal one third. Flipping over to example three, the cost in thousands for widgets or us to produce x and x is in one thousands as well uh, of its widgets is given by this and this is a cost function. So if we put a number in place of x, we'll get the cost function to, pl to produce that number. And this is the demand function. Demand function, some people call it the price function. And so if we put a certain number in place of x, they'll tell us what the price is that people will be willing to pay for that level of production. So we're asked to write a function that represents the company's profits on sales of its x, widget, x of its widgets. The profit function is revenue minus cost, or uh, this is revenue and this is cost. Revenue is the price that you're getting multiplied by how many you sell. So we'll get that uh, demand function, this is the demand function, multiplied by x, and then we'll subtract the cost function we were given. So if we expand this out, expand x in here, and remove these brackets and collect like terms, this is our profit function. Uh, there's a like term, those two add together, 0.98x minus 0.24x is 0.74x, and then we have the minus 230. So that is our profit function. Uh, two more examples and uh, to end off this one. We're asked to graph the cost, revenue, and profit function. So here's the cost, the revenue, and that profit function. And um, this is a, a, a positive quadratic that opens up. Uh, you could graph it with a table of values. The 230 means that it starts at 230. If we put 0 in place of x, it starts at 230 and opens up. If, for example, you put 1,000 in place of x, you'll find that 1,000 in place of x here, the cost is um, a little under 600. And you could graph that using a couple of uh, uh, points if you wanted to. Uh, the revenue function is a negative quadratic function starts at zero and looks like this and again you could graph it using technology or make a table of values and this is the profit function from the uh, previous page profit is here actually and again you use technology or, or make a table of values now the uh, red function is cost the uh, r the black function is the revenue profit is um, uh, revenue minus cost. So in this area here where revenue is higher than cost you have a profit. In fact the highest profit occurs here it's at about 1200 and notice that's the part right there where there's a, the biggest difference between the two functions. So that's why the the uh, highest profit it would be here at about 1200. If we graph this uh, use um, this is using a graph and calculator this is what it looks like. Now, we're asked to see what's the maximum profit and for what production level does it occur. And if I put some uh, a different uh, calculator screen image here, uh, we'll find that that point occurs where x is 1200 and we get 226 for y. So that means that the maximum profit of 226,000 occurs when you're producing 1200,000 or 1.2 million widgets. So that's when the maximum profit occurs. And I'm just using uh, the technology. Uh, if I wanted to f another way to find that, I could have found the two zeros. And the middle between those is the, uh, the x coordinate of that vertex. And I could have found that like that as well. That would have worked just fine. And that's the end of the lesson.